Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute, and I'm delighted that we are presenting with you for you another fantastic, uh, thought-provoking seminar moving forward, and for. Today, our speaker is Professor Joseph Wong of the Munn School for Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Professor Wong is the Vice President International at the University of Toronto. He's also the uh, Ross and Ralph Halbert Professor of Innovation at the Munn School and Professor of Political Science. He was educated at McGill University as well as the University of Wisconsin Madison campus. Joe is a fantastic scholar who has published very widely on many different subjects covering not only uh, China but other countries in Asia and more uh, general subjects. He is author to many academic articles and books. I'll only highlight the two books that I thought are particularly interesting and important, and they are authored by him himself. And that is Healthy Democracies, Welfare Politics in Taiwan and South Korea, and Betting on Biotech, Innovation and the Limits of Asia's Developmental State, both were published by Cornell University Press. He is at the moment working on three projects, one of which is the basis of what I think he is going to speak to us um, in the next hour or so. And that is the uh, collaborative book that he's working with Dan Slater, which is on Asia's development and democracy. The other two projects are the political economy of the welfare states in East Asia, which I think he is planning to publish with Cambridge University Press. And he's also on a new project which focuses on poverty and innovation. With that, I will hand over to you, uh, Professor Wang, to speak on the subject of why China should democratize and sooner rather than later a subject which I'm sure will elicit a lot of interesting responses. Over to you, Joe. Great, thank you so much, Steve. It's, uh, it's an honor uh, to be invited to be a part of this seminar series. It's uh, been, I think, about six years since I was last at SOAS. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be interacting with and engaging with um, the audience there, as well as the communities that you bring together um, at SOAS. Um, so very grateful for this. I'm also grateful for this opportunity because, as you say, Steve, this is uh, what I'm sharing with uh, folks today as part of a larger book uh, project that I'm in the midst of completing now with Professor Dan Slater of the University of Michigan, uh, and it's a book project that we're almost finished uh, uh, drafting the first draft now, and that's to be forthcoming with, uh, with Princeton. Um, the title of the talk is indeed uh, intended to be provocative, uh, why China should democratize and to uh, put a finer point on it, democratize sooner rather than later. And um, I, I'll say from the outset that part of this title is driven by, uh, for me anyway, a normative concern uh, uh, around democracy and democratization and the importance of, uh, of transitions to democracy. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, from an analytical point of view, why China should democratize is also something that is a very or a function of a strategic rationale. That is to say, the Chinese Communist Party should democratize because at the moment it is a strong regime uh, that by democratizing sooner rather than later, it should portend a stable transition 
and indeed a democratic transition sooner rather than later uh, in all likelihood would result in the Chinese Communist Party maintaining its hold on power. And so the title, even though it might evoke uh, what some might see to be a critical view of China and the CCP, in fact, the argument that I'm going to make is not at all um, anti-regime, but rather from a strategic point of view, uh, something that the party should consider again sooner rather than later. If I go to the next slide now. Um, so the purpose of this talk, or how I want to frame this talk really is to situate it against the backdrop of what we might see as being the conventional wisdom of not only democratization more generally, but uh, when and where democracy will arise uh, in China. And that is the conventional wisdom that democracy emerges from the ashes of authoritarian collapse. Uh, as we see here in this quote from Professor Tang, ever since the domino collapse of communist regimes in the Soviet bloc in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the world has been waiting for China to follow suit, to collapse itself. No one can be sure about how long the Chinese regime will last, but it shows no sign of collapsing anytime soon. So again, the conventional wisdom here is that uh, democracy emerges out of weakness. Uh, you have a regime that is increasingly weakened. It experiences a legitimacy crisis. It often uh, manifests itself in an internal crisis between different factions within the regime. And that the regime uh, becomes so weak that it collapses under its own weight or that it's overthrown. In other words, <clears throat> as we can see from this quote and this observation, and indeed, indeed how we oftentimes think about democracy, it's that democratization will occur during bad times. Now, in our view, um, and the argument we make in the book is that indeed democracy can come during bad times, democracy can emerge out of weakness, but democracy can also emerge uh, from good times, uh, or democracy can emerge uh, when a party is strong. Indeed, we can see, or the argument we make is that democracy can emerge when the ruling party is still legitimate, when the ruling party is organizationally coherent and strong. Uh, the ruling party or regime does not experience a major internal crisis. The ruling regime is not about to collapse. In fact, it is very stable. In other words, the argument we make is that democracy can emerge when the ruling or incumbent party is strong. And that's the argument, that's the overarching argument that we make in our book. And it builds on uh, the argument that we make in our Perspectives on Politics piece, our PO Peace article from 2013. And again, the argument is basically that an authoritarian regime is more likely to concede democracy, to maintain its hold on power, and to preside over a stable transition when it is strong. And it does so because it enjoys what we call both victory confidence, that is that it enjoys the confidence that it will be uh, not only not obsolete in democracy, but that in fact it will continue to hold power and that it also enjoys what we call stability confidence. Now, the book that we're writing is not a book about China. Um, our editor uh, uh, was quite keen, I think, at first for us to really center the book around the China case, given the importance and timeliness of this question in the Chinese context. And this is not what we do. Dan Slater is a specialist of Southeast Asia. And as Steve has indicated, I've written much more extensively on Northeast Asian cases beyond uh, China. But we did concede that we would write a chapter or two uh, around China and uh, about China. And so the China case study is a case study within a larger comparative project. Uh, and it is a case study of uh, one of 12 different uh, cases. The chapter uh, on China that we have written, however, does look at uh, China up to the Tiananmen Square uh, crisis of 1989. And the argument we make in that chapter is that democracy does not arrive in China in June of 1989 not because the regime uh, uh, was so weak, but rather the argument we make is that the regime at the time in 1989 was not strong enough to democratize through strength, that it was not strong enough to democratize uh, 
in a way in which the regime uh, was confident that it could maintain power and that it would be able to preside over a stable transition for a whole host of reasons from the economic, the more proximate economic crises that China was experiencing after 1985, 86 or so. Uh, the fact that many of the hard economic reforms were yet to come, really quite a diminished state capacity in the wake of uh, the Cultural Revolution. The party itself was split, uh, not just in June of 1989, but the split really emerges uh, in 1986 and 87. And of course, the extraordinary protest uh, that the regime is confronted with, again, not only in the summer of 89, spring and summer of 89, but dating back to the end of 86 and 87. In other words, the argument we make in the case of China is that in June of 1989, it had neither victory nor stability confidence. It was not a strong enough regime to consider democratization through strength. All that being said, and indeed, I think in many ways, one of the um, one of the legacies of June 4th, 89, is the indelible impact that it's had or imprint that it's had on how we think about democratic prospects uh, in China. And again, I wanna emphasize that the prevailing conventional wisdom in uh, around China and the prospects of democracy in China centers around a collapse scenario. So if we take, for instance, and here I'm just citing David Shambaugh's piece uh, on the coming crack up, which I think is reflective of uh, a whole school of thought within and among China observers, is this notion that the end game of Chinese communist rule has begun. It's progressed further than many think. President Xi Jinping exudes conviction and confidence and so forth. But as he says, this hard personality belies a party and political system that is extremely fragile on the inside. In other words, you know, as David Shambaugh calls it, the coming crack up, uh, of the regime, it really is about identifying the cracks in the regime that portend its potential collapse and out of this crisis and collapse scenario is the only way in which we might imagine a democratic transition occurring. So in a strange way, I mean, an ironic way, our Democrat, uh, people who are hopeful for democratic transition are looking for signs of regime collapse. Uh, the other view is a view, and here I'm quoting Daniel Bell in his book, The China Model, but again, it can, uh, I think it reflects a, a pretty dominant prevailing view around the situation in China now, as is, is, uh, Daniel Bell writes, China's single party state structure didn't collapse in 89. If anything, it seems to have strengthened since the early 1990s. And therefore, liberal democracy seems to be further off than ever before, right? So. The argument here is that what we have is a strong party, a strong regime. We have the absence of crisis and collapse, and therefore we have the absence of democratic prospects in China. The argument, the implicit argument being made here is that the regime does not need to democratize. Either way, if you're looking at the, um, the coming collapse scenario, the Shambaugh's and other observers, or the uh, resilience scenario, and in, in fact, the um, not just resilience, but the uh, the strengthening of the regime scenario that Daniel Bell puts forward. Either way, the expectation of democracy in China uh, centers around the prospects of crisis and collapse. In the event of a crisis and collapse, we may uh, expect democracy to emerge. In the absence of crisis, then we should expect that no democracy will emerge. And the argument or the sense that Dan and I bring to this question is that this is, this is not the only question we can ask of the China case. In fact, in many ways, it's a bad question to ask of the China case because um, you know, no one wishes uh, upon China and Chinese people the collapse of the regime. That would just be calamitous for not only uh, China and Chinese people, but for the entire world and just also seems normatively um, uh, unethical to be wishing collapse on anyone. But it's also the wrong question to ask because it assumes that the conventional wisdom, i.e. democracy will emerge through crisis, is the only pathway for democratic transition. And our book really puts at its center alternative pathways to democracy. And the argument we make here is that ultimately uh, uh, democratization uh, is a reflection of choices, that people have to make choices. It's not just simply a structural imperative that creates democracy, but rather structures and structural imperatives may compel certain choices to be made. 
and that ultimately uh, a pathway to democracy results in the choice to concede democracy. And therefore, what we're looking for in this book are alternative pathways of democratic possibility and indeed possibilities for democracy to emerge when and where you might not expect it. To reiterate, reiterate again, the conventional wisdom is uh, particularly in China is that democracy will come with crisis and when the ruling regime is weak. But in our argument, democracy through strength, we suggest that authoritarian regimes, strong and stable ones, can choose democracy when they are strong and not weak. And therefore, the two questions that animate our book are, why do some authoritarian regimes choose democracy? And why do some authoritarian regimes choose democracy when they don't need to, i.e. when they continue to be strong? That's the puzzle that drives uh, the book. And again, um, the case of China is one of many situated in there, but I wanna use that theory today to animate some discussion around the prospects of democracy in China. Our theory hinges on a key insight that Barbara Geddes and others have pointed out, in which she says, the preferences of party cadres are much simpler than those of military officers. Like democratic politicians, cadres simply want to hold office. So we work with the assumption that party cadres and parties, their primary preference, political preference, is that they want to stay in power. How they stay in power is less relevant or less important, but rather that they maintain power. So in our book, for instance, and indeed in the article that we wrote in POP in 2013, one of the cases that we draw on is the example of Indonesia. In Indonesia, I think, uh, provides for us an instructive story. It demonstrates the logic that we are arguing, but it's also our weakest case. Uh, and so I wanna just go over that very quickly so you get a sense of how the theory works in action. So if we go back in time to May of 1998, um, we have uh, Suharto who is overthrown in the wake of the Asian financial crisis. In many ways, this looks like the end of the ruling Golkar party. Habibi takes over who is by every measure a very weak president and his regime looks as though it's hanging on by a thread. Now, conventional wisdom uh, around authoritarianism is that uh, this regime would repress, a la Barbara Getty's point here, to hang on to power is the most important preference for any uh, regime, and therefore to hang on to power, the regime will repress. But we actually see something different happen in Indonesia. Rather than repress, the Golkar ruling party under Habibi, in fact, expedites elections, moves them from 2002, which was the scheduled time for elections, to 1999. And indeed, in many ways, this would seem counterintuitive because in many ways it was simply expediting his own defeat. Our argument and our interpretation of those events take a slightly different take or a slightly different spin. Our argument is that while Habibi himself was a very weak president, the party, the Golkar party, in fact, was very strong. After all, it had, uh, it had um, integrated itself with the developmental state apparatus. It certainly had territorial advantage in terms of its reach into the periphery. And it also had a developmental record that it could trade on in terms of uh, electoral politics. In other words, while Habibi is weak, while the regime looks to be on its heels, it still had enough strength and accumulated strength such that by expediting the elections, it was in fact increasing the probability that the regime and the party would survive. And therefore by having the elections in 1999 instead of 2002, this was actually the best option, not for Habibi, but for the Golkar party because the party was still relatively strong. In fact, in, 1999, in 1999, Golkar did emerge as the second largest party in the legislature. It, it, in 2004, it regained its plurality of seats in the legislature. Uh, had it waited until 2002, it may have hurtled through and lost all legitimacy. In other words, by expediting the elections, 
uh, by conceding democracy sooner rather than later, it actually helped save the ruling party from its own obsolescence. obsolescence. In other words, it conceded democratic possibilities to survive. We even go so far as to make this argument in the case of Japan, and this is a case that we cover extensively in the book. The conventional wisdom around the Japanese case in terms of post-war democratization is that democracy was effectively imposed upon uh, Japanese elites uh, through uh, American triumphalism. Uh, in other words, the conventional wisdom is that democracy was imposed upon Japan, the Japanese elites had no agency, they had no choice, uh, that what we saw was the conversion of authoritarians into Democrats through military might and U.S. occupation. Now, there's no denying, of course, that the U.S. occupation played an important role in the democratization of post-war Japan, but we argue that it's not the full story, that in fact, when you delve into the details, what we see actually through the period of 45 through 47 is the passage through of uh, Japanese conservative elites who had first arisen to uh, political prominence as well as political institutionalization through the era of Taisho democracy in the 20s and 30s, which of course gives way to fascism. But those conservative elites who pass through, in fact, are tasked with drafting the first constitution uh, in post-war Japan. And now this constitution and this constitutional draft is unknown to many in the West because it was eventually scrapped and indeed the constitution that the American constitutional draft was put together was the one that was institutionalized uh, and passed in Japan. But the original constitution that these conservatives were asked to draft was in fact basically the Meiji constitution redo. So it's not as though these conservatives had passed through and suddenly had become Democrats and indeed even in the wake of the start of the occupation, when given the political agency to draft their own constitution, alluded to and basically mimicked a constitution that was no better or no more democratic than Taisho era uh, Japanese politics. The argument we make, however, is that notwithstanding this first attempt at constitutional drafting, it becomes very clear for the conservative elites in Japan that democracy actually works in their favor that they have with them a degree of what we call antecedent strength, i.e. some degree of party institutionalization, some ties, some quite deep ties to the bureaucracy, which itself was not dismantled uh, by the uh, occupation, as well as some institutional legacies that it could take advantage of in terms of competing for elections. Democracy works for conservatives, especially after 1947 in the US reverse course policy, in which the US effectively eliminates the conservatives main rival on the left. In other words, democracy for Japanese conservatives who had up until 45 and 46, no interest, legitimate, real, genuine interest in democracy. Democracy in fact becomes in their best interest, the political path forward. So it's not as though conservatives were politically prostrate in Japan. It's not as though a, a democracy democratic constitution was unilaterally imposed on Japan. Rather, we see, in fact, Japanese conservatives conspiring and conceding democracy, not because they were committed Democrats per se, but because it gave them the best opportunity to make, uh, remain the most dominant political force. And of course, this creates the antecedent to what will eventually become the LDP, the most dominant political party in a democracy. The key point here we're making is that the original impulse among these conservative elites was to preserve authoritarianism. But the concession of democracy, in fact, worked to these elites' best interests. The best case uh, that we, I think, that we present in the book, uh, and indeed anybody who knows the story of Taiwan knows that we in many ways inductively generate our theory of democracy through strength from the Taiwanese case, uh, the best case of our theory really is Taiwan, right? Taiwan in, 19, in the mid-1980s was a brutal regime. Uh, it was by every measure uh, uh, an extremely authoritarian regime that had no problems resorting to the blunt edge of repression to maintain power. And yet in 1986, the DPP or uh, 
The DPP is formed in the fall of 1986 illegally. Um, many observers at the time wondered if the regime would resort to its standard operating procedures and responses, which would be to quash the emergent institutional opposition, and it doesn't. In 1987, martial law is lifted. In 1989, limited legislative elections occur with full legislative elections following in 92, and of course, presidential elections in 1996. Most expected uh, Taiwan in the mid-1990s to repress the emergent opposition. But as uh, Jiang Jingguo himself says, the times are changing, the environment is changing, the tide is also changing. So in other words, the KMT concedes or begins the process of concession in 1986, when in fact it's still a very powerful ruling party. The economy continued to be strong. Uh, the uh, KMT uh, remained electorally popular. Now, again, uh, the limited elections that were institutionalized in Taiwan were by uh, not at all near free nor fair, but as a gauge in terms of electoral signals, the KMT had not plummeted in its popularity. It was beginning to wane, uh, but it was still um, electorally dominant. And the opposition itself was very weak. In other words, as the um, opposition emerges in the mid 1980s, the KMT did not, KMT did not have to concede. It was still very powerful. It certainly could have hung on. And what we see, in fact, is uh, uh, President Zhang uh, gambling and betting on uh, the KMT's ability to be dominant in democracy. And of course, we see this huge payoff emerge for the ruling party in 89, 92. In 96 and thereafter. In other words, the KMT to concedes not in a period or a moment of crisis and imminent collapse, but rather the KMT concedes with both strength and confidence. And it had many uh, reasons to be confident, and it had many sources of accumulated strength, everything from its developmental state record. Uh, its record of economic growth, its record of relatively balanced economic growth. It was a well-organized political party, having gone a reorganization campaign in the 1950s. It was disciplined. It had institutionalized a very sophisticated, if shady, electoral machine. It had begun to adapt in the 1970s through the Taiwanization process to, uh, to localize the party. It also adhered to an electoral system, the non-transferable multi-member district system, which advantaged the KMT and disadvantaged the emerging opposition. And as well, it was transitioning through relatively stable times. In other words, the KMT concedes not to uh, lose, but to win. Right? Conceding democracy is not tantamount to conceding defeat. And as we write in our 2013 art uh, article, the KMT ultimately chose to concede because the party was in a position not of desperation, but a fairly strong confidence that a democratic concession would ensure both the KMT's electoral victory and the maintenance of stability. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. So from those cases, our, our theory of democracy through strength has three parts. The first is, is that the incumbent authoritarian regime um, accumulates what we call antecedent strengths, uh, a developmental record, uh, party organization, party coherence, the reach of the party, a legitimation, a political legitimation formula that they're able to trade on for uh, political support and so forth. It's these antecedent strengths that give a regime both the stability confidence, i.e. the confidence that a transition would be stable as well as victory confidence that a transition would uh, in all likelihood result in that incumbent party maintaining victory or uh, maintaining power. So part of the theory is about the accumulation of antecedent strength. That being said, a regime is most likely to concede democracy through strength when it has passed its apex of power. So a democracy is most likely to occur when the ruling regime has just passed its apex of power when its power is beginning to slowly wane. And it knows this because it receives and interprets a variety of signals. The clearest signal, for instance, would be electoral. So a regime sees that it maintains dominance, but that its electoral fortunes begin to decline. One of the other cases that we look at is the case of South Korea, 
and the ruling conservative uh, authoritarian party there over the course of several elections through the 70s and so most certainly into the 80s sees its uh, electoral support continuing to decline. Public protest in contentious politics is another signal. Uh, we also take seriously geopolitical signals, the loss of a superpower patron, pressure from an out external superpower uh, force and so forth is another kind of signal. And we see this uh, in all of the cases that we look at, as well as economic signals, uh, economic crisis, economic uh, hardships and challenges are a signal. That's a less clear signal because oftentimes regimes are able to deflect political blame, but nonetheless, it's a signal that an incumbent regime has to take seriously. The argument we make here is that, again, when a regime is just past its apex of power is when it's most likely to concede democracy through strength uh, and most likely able to maintain its hold on power. When a regime just past its apex of power, we call this the bittersweet spot. It's bitter because uh, the authoritarian jig is up uh, and it's time to transition. It's sweet, however, because uh, uh, the regime, provided it's just past its apex of power, uh, has a strong likelihood that it will maintain power and it will be able to preside over a stable transition. This then triggers the third part of our theory, and that is that regimes, upon assessing their accumulated strengths and interpreting signals, uh, begin to consider re-legitimation strategies in order for them to stay in power. One way and one choice they can make, of course, is to not concede and to hang on to authoritarianism. Uh, another is to start conceding decisive democratic reforms uh, by which we are talking about the institutionalization of free and fair elections, the introduction of an electoral commission, media reform, and so forth. And so this strategy for re-legitimation and the strategy to stay in power uh, is, a, is a conflict in which one option, in fact, is conceding democracy. Here is just a visual depiction of what we're talking about. Um, this doesn't appear in the book, but it helps kind of visualize um, what we mean when we say the apex of power. As you can see, uh, an incumbent regime accumulates strength over time. It reaches an apex. And as it uh, uh, passes over the apex of power, it enters into what we call the bittersweet spot. The bittersweet spot is the ideal time to concede through strength. After a certain period, and we've here marked it with the dotted line, the supermajority, after the party has hurtled through the bittersweet spot, uh, in fact, the best option for that regime, if it wants to hang on to power, is to repress. So an authoritarian regime accumulates strength over time. It hits its apex of power. It enters the bittersweet spot. This is where Taiwan was. This is where Korea was. Uh, Indonesia was, although it was it was slightly further down. This is where a concession, a democratic concession, makes the most sense. However, once a regime hurdles through that bittersweet spot, its best option is to uh, repress. Hence the paradox uh, of our theory here, and as we write in 2013, when a ruling party or an authoritarian party enjoys substantial incumbent capacity, in other words, power, this not only increases its ability to sustain authoritarian rule, but can lessen its imperative to do so. Right? So when a regime is strong, it has the capacity to maintain the course of authoritarianism, but it may also present itself as the ideal time to democratize precisely because it would be democratizing through strength. Now, this in many ways seems counterintuitive, um, but in empirical reality, actually, it's not that counterintuitive. And indeed, uh, in the cases that we examine in our book, cases like Indonesia, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, it was not counterintuitive. In fact, that was the modal pathway of democratic transition in the region, but also globally, right? So um, now there's going to be some discrepancy in terms of how we code this, but Basically, the argument here is that in 1986, there were 83 authoritarian ruling parties in the world. Since that time, 35 of them have remained authoritarian. 48 of them, uh, this is as of three years ago, went through a political transition. And of that 48, 15 are now obsolete, 
but a total of 33 continue to exist. And in fact, 18 of them, so 18 of 33 that continue to exist, continue to be either the ruling party or a major political party. In other words, the empirical evidence seems to suggest that it may in fact be incentive compatible for strong authoritarian regimes to concede democracy. Uh, and, uh, and both Dan and I have written on uh, the ways in which these authoritarian successor parties in fact can become a potential stabilizing force uh, after democratic transition has occurred. So the question then, uh, when we think about that theory now, uh, the, the intuitive uh, question we'd want to put to China, I think, becomes pretty clear. And that is, why might China democratize a place where you probably would least expect it, and short of a collapse, uh, when you would least expect it? And in our view, the democratic possibility, at least theoretically, is very real in China. And in fact, one might make the argument that the current moment is the best time for the current Chinese Communist Party to succeed because it continues to be extremely powerful. It continues to be popular. One can argue that it has passed and just passed its apex of power. There are certainly looming problems on the horizon that do not portend stability for the regime over the longer term. Uh, and so if there was ever a time for the, the regime to concede democracy through strength, now would be the time. It would be inconceivable that the Chinese Communist Party would not win. And indeed, uh, one can uh, reasonably expect that if China were to democratize, it would not fall apart. In fact, it may serve to stabilize uh, the country, particularly in peripheral regions. It may also, uh, uh, another reason why we might expect China to democratize through strength sooner rather than later is because of what Bruce Dixon refers to as the dictator's dilemma. And in his recent book, or not so recent anymore, a couple of years ago, he portrays the CCP as a party of reform, but a party of reform without democracy. And this party of reform uh, creates uh, for itself a double-edged sword. And as Bruce puts it, rather than solidifying the CCP's hold on power, these reforms in fact instead create greater challenges to the ruling party. So as the party continues to reform, it opens up new vistas of potential challenges, which is Dan and I call, or what we refer to as the regime becoming increasingly hemmed in. Uh, and indeed, this feeds to uh, uh, the idea of the Tocquevillian notion of a revolution of rising expectations. So rather than understanding political conflict in China today as uh, exemplar of presentist deprivation, that is to say, uh, uh, the kind of conflict that is a function of deprivation and in political inequalities today, it's, it's rather a, a revolution of rising expectations over time. So the argument basically here, and I refer again to this graph, uh, that despite or maybe even perhaps because of the dictator's dilemma, as Bruce has outlined for us, democracy is possible in China because we have a regime that is very powerful. It is at or near the apex of its political power. One can reasonably make an argument that it has passed its apex of power but that nonetheless, its accumulated antecedent strengths should give it victory confidence that it would maintain political power in the event of a democratic transition. And it should also have stability confidence that its, uh, that its grip on political power and the institutions that it's put into place should maintain stability. Indeed, the lesson that the regime should take is not the lesson that is dominant uh, the lesson the regime should take from the collapse of the Soviet Union and the CPSU's fate, which is not the dominant view in the party, is not that the CPSU and the collapse of the Soviet Union resulted from a regime conceding democracy. Rather, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the obsolescence of the CPSU was the result of a regime conceding democracy too late. And so therefore, the lesson that the CCP should take from the CPSU is you should concede democracy when you're stronger rather than you're weaker. In other words, conceding democracy sooner rather than later. 
Now, there are several reasons, and of course, folks in this room will know them uh, as much as I do, uh, and no doubt even more um, uh, with even greater depth than I would. There are many reasons why, despite the theoretical expectation that China should democratize sooner rather than later, that democracy remains improbable uh, in China, uh, if not over the longer term, most certainly in the near term. Some of the reasons why a democracy through strength scenario in China remains improbable include things like, for instance, the electoral signals are unclear. One of the things that really benefited the KMT in Taiwan was that the elections, as much of a sham as they were, were an important feedback loop for the regime to really receive quite clearly signals from Taiwan society about its waning hold on political power. Uh, signals in China are unclear. Uh, the central regime has done an extraordinarily effective job of defecting, uh, deflecting political blame, localizing, for instance, contentious politics, offloading uh, um, political pathologies and economic challenges uh, to local levels. The Chinese regime so far has resisted U.S. pressure and has, in fact, created a very powerful counter narrative to U.S. pressure. So the geopolitical variable has been neutralized. In fact, I think has in many ways strengthened the regime. And uh, the regime has done a very good job of normalizing uh, the economic slowdown, uh, talking about the new normal, uh, talking about and managing expectations of continued economic transformation in, Ch in China and so forth. And so there, uh, the economic slowdown in China has had an unclear effect on the regime. I think most importantly, though, uh, in terms of why a democracy through strength uh, scenario is improbable in China is because many who are inside the party who, or who think about the party don't really have a good sense of where the party is on that curve that I have here up on the slide right now. Um, I've given or we've given this talk many times in China. Uh, uh, we've given this, um, shared this theory in many seminars in China and spoken to a lot of people in China about this. And one of the things that I, you know, is, is, um, is emblazoned in my mind is, is you know, one of the things that we'll do is we will ask folks just in a, in a, in a vote, where do people think the party is on this curve? And uh, haven't done this in a few years. Um, this is something we don't talk so much about in China anymore. But uh, as of about three years ago, when we did a straw poll, what was really interesting was that, and we gave them four choices. The party is still rising. The party is at its apex. The party has just passed its apex, or the party has hurtled through. And uh, the votes among folks in that audience uh, was a four-way even split. About a quarter felt the party was on the rise. A quarter felt the party was at its apex. A quarter felt the party was just past its apex. And indeed, a quarter felt the party had already hurtled through the bittersweet spot. So not knowing where the party is on the curve uh, is a serious challenge for the ruling regime, understanding if it's just past its apex of power, if it's continuing to accumulate power, or worse yet, uh, that it's already hurtled through the bittersweet spot. The absence of those signals is a real challenge and therefore makes a democracy through strength scenario uh, improbable. So let me just finish off by saying that I think that there are potentially three pathways that China uh, may take here. One again is China's democratic improbability for all the reasons that I've just described. The second is uh, China's very proactive democratic avoidance uh, that the Chinese Communist Party continues to be a party of reform uh, and it continues to be a party of reform that uh, is able to reform legal systems, governance structures and so forth but ones that nonetheless actively frustrate and mean uh, and avoid meaningfully democratic reforms. And we can see a lot of this uh, under uh, the early Xi Jinping era. Uh, and we can certainly see it now in the leadership's demeanor in terms of uh, its view on democracy. It really is now uh, a party of democracy avoidance. And the third, and, and perhaps this is something that democratic uh, optimists and hopefuls will continue to hold on to is China's democratic possibility. 
that in fact, a democracy through strength scenario may unfold in China, that the regime might preemptively concede democracy and not because of a bottom-up revolution, uh, not because the regime proves itself imminently weakened and on the precipice of collapse, and certainly not because autocrats suddenly discover themselves to be liberal Democrats, but rather because from the point of view of the CCP, the cost of avoiding democracy any longer becomes increasingly and prohibitively high, and that it makes sense for the party and for China to concede democracy from strength and to concede democracy sooner rather than later. So I'm gonna end my comments there. Um, appreciate your attention. Um, and as I say, again, this talk was intended to really be a provocation uh, and a provocation that uses a way of thinking about democracy through strength to assess democratic prospects in China. So thank you so much for your time and your attention. Well, thank you very much, Joel, for this fantastic and thoughtful um, presentations. I think we already have a lot of questions which would challenge some of your arguments. Before we go there, just let me remind everybody that um, this session is being recorded and it should be available later on. And if you are concerned about your identity, when you raise your questions on the Q&A box, you simply need to say that you would like your identity not to be revealed, in which case I will not read out your name or your affiliation, but it will still be useful if you could provide the information on the Q&A box so that I know where you are coming from. It also enables me to get as good a spread of questions from different people of different backgrounds and geographical locations as possible. And this being on a subject which politically is potentially sensitive, I would urge you to think hard about it before you want to put your name on uh, for open consumption. And before I open it to general discussion, Joe, could I start off by asking you a question about the um, perhaps methodology? Because one of, I mean, you, it's a very thoughtful theory. You have considered a lot of very important issues. And having looked at Taiwan's democratization, I warm to a lot of what you say. But there's one factor which I thought you have not taken into account which is the regime type, the very nature of the political system in place. Does it actually matter or does it not? The great contrast between say the Taiwan system and the system on the Chinese mainland is of course that on the mainland, you have a true Leninist political system, which believe it or not, is still committed to communism. This certainly is under Xi Jinping. Whereas in Taiwan, the system, hard as it was as an, author, as an authoritarian system, it really never functioned properly as a Leninist system. It never had a proper ideology in the ways that communism is an ideology. And the conviction that a system is the right one and it is on the right side of history. Does it matter or does it not matter? Um, it absolutely matters. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the chapters, later chapters in the book, we have one chapter on China up to 89, which is, again, as I say, it's really the argument that we want to make there is don't think of June 4th, 89 as a moment of potential democracy through strength. In fact, what we saw there was really uh, a weak regime, uh, but that since that point, the regime has accumulated many strengths. The subsequent chapter in the book, actually, we, we, we write the chapter as a cluster of cases in which uh, China is a, a key one, but we call it developmental socialist, the developmental socialist cluster. So these are all um, um, ideological regimes, socialist ideological regimes and you're absolutely right in the sense that a regime that um, continues to hold 
to a particular ideology, even if in practice, right, beginning, um, certainly beginning in the late 70s, 80s, uh, 90s, and less so today, uh, but there was a period where in practice, this was a regime that implemented more pragmatic, certainly market conforming reforms and so forth that in many ways would betray the ideological foundations of the party, uh, that there is still a narrative, a very deeply entrenched narrative within the regime around uh, uh, a Leninist ideology. And part of that, uh, part of the constraints or why that's constraining is that there is no, um, there's no potential for a democratic heritage as well. I mean, if you look, for instance, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, KMT documents and early Republican China uh, documents that you will see uh, allusions to, um, to democracy. It is within the realm of possibility. When you talk to the conservative authoritarians in Korea, they see democracy as being very much part of their own heritage. And indeed they see democracy as, as a way of sort of squaring some of the contradictions um, that the, uh, the authoritarian regime was facing in the eighties. You don't see this in Vietnam. You don't see this uh, certainly in North Korea and you don't see this in China. And so that's, that I agree with you is a very uh, limiting factor. Okay. The first question I picked is from um, Graham Hutchings. In some ways it's sort of parallel the kind of the question I raised, but from a very different perspective. He thanks you for the fantastic talk and then asks you, do we need to pay more attention and perhaps seems to be at work in the arguments, your arguments in the starting point and its backstory? It is when it comes down to an authoritarian party and country that might seek to undertake a democratic transition. In other words, is there not something about the nature and the history of the CCP and perhaps mainland Chinese political culture that makes a generalized theory of democratic transition very hard to maintain? So here the focus is more on the history mm -hmm. and the nature of the Communist Party of China. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, and uh, as I, I alluded to in my response to your initial question, Steve, the centrality of ideology uh, is important and an ideology that does not permit democratic possibility uh, is important um, in the DNA of the regime. I also think there's something to be said about revolutionary parties, um, folks like Luke and Wei and Steve Levitsky and others have written about this, but revolutionary parties, um, also have uh, uh, a genetic allergy to democracy, I think, because uh, for revolutionary parties, the main concern is really about stability and the fear of instability and the fear of chaos, and indeed the fear of the kind of chaos that would ensue through political reform of any kind, but most certainly through democratic reform. Um, and, and this, I think, is something that is very, important in the historiography of the party, but also in terms of how the party views prospect of political reform. I mean, when you look back to 89 um, and, and you think about what motivates the regime there, uh, particularly the emergence and quite quick coalescence of the hardline faction beginning in 86 and 87, and frankly, relatively uncontroversial, is, is it's couched in the recentness of the chaos and destruction of the Cultural Revolution, the, the as then as yet inability of the regime to consolidate its power, its organizational coherence, to preside over a stable China. That was the major preoccupation, much more so than even what we call victory confidence. I think that was much less important uh, in China in 89, and that has carried forward. So the upshot of my response is, is to is to concede just that is that there is that revolutionary parties have a deep fear of instability uh and that deep fear of instability uh prohibits them from venturing into a democratic transformation okay the next one is from uh several uh, individuals so i'm not going to uh, mention all their names the question essentially is that you mentioned taiwan as an example 
But then the KMT eventually lost power. Mm -hmm. Would that therefore not deter the Communist Party from taking that option? Um, so this is a question. Uh, this is a question of sort of strategic takes on on um, on the, on a political party. So it's absolutely right. The KMT um, uh, loses certainly executive power as soon as two thousand when uh, Chun is elected president. Um, I mean, the KMT has always maintained legislative dominance, uh, almost virtually unassailable throughout Taiwan's democratic history, but there are points where it's in coalition. Um, so as a party in the, in the legislature, it has maintained uh, dominance, although it has lost the executive. Um, it has never, however, become obsolete, and it is not, um, uh, even when it's on, even when it was on its throes of a death spiral more recently, when we thought, "Oh, the KMT has gone forever," it continues to be a major political party. It has con it has avoided political obsolescence, and um, the argument we would make is the reason why it's avoided that is because it conceded democracy at a time when it was still very strong, when it was able to control in many ways the post democratic transition electoral agenda. I've written extensively, for instance, about how the KMT uh, adopts uh, a much more progressive social policy agenda, uh, despite its own conservative heritage, as a way of becoming and maintaining its electoral dominance soon after democratic transition. Those political luxuries, that strategic latitude that was afforded to the KMT in the 1990s and into the 2000s was a function of, of the fact that the regime conceded democracy when it was still relatively strong. Now, one might make the argument, had the regime waited and waited until it became considerably weaker, uh, that it ran the risk of political obsolescence. Uh, and it most certainly ran the risk of not having the strategic levers to shape the post-transition order in which it would be most beneficial to the incumbent regime. So that's the question that the CCP has to ask itself. I mean, I think it's, it's and I'm not being flipped when I say this, but nothing lasts forever. Um, and so if, if one uh, thinks about the prospects of democratic transition, um, the, the strategic advice I would give to the CCP, which has done remarkable things in China, so it's presided over the most extraordinary uh, socioeconomic human trans development transformation in human history that it should consider conceding before it's too late. Because the longer it waits to concede, the less strategic latitude that it has to shape the post-transition order uh, in ways that strategically advantage the ruling party. So yes, the KMT eventually loses executive power, but it has retained its position as a major political party. The opposite or the the cautionary tale um, the CCP should consider is that if you wait too long, you could suffer the fate of the CPSU, which is its obsolescence. So this is a strategic decision the party has to make, and it has to make a strategic decision around the timing of the concession and the kinds of concessions it's willing to make. But the upshot is don't wait too long because the fate could be far worse than what this KMT has experienced. And we have seen that in, in uh, many countries around the world. Well, the next question I'm picking is from a SOAS graduate, uh, Matthew Conde. His question is, what is the motive for senior leadership in authoritarian regimes to endorse a transition to democracy when they risk being investigated or put on trial for abuse of power that were committed during their tenure. For example, the current standing committee of the Politburo exposed itself to trial for human rights abuse in Xinjiang. Yeah. The party itself may well su survive and indeed even thrive, but the leadership may not. And why would they do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, who was that from a SOAS graduate? SOAS graduate. I think you've hit the nail on the head that um, is at the core, really, of the of the theory and you know of the limitations of uh, of our theory. Because at its core, our theory um, 
is a strategic choice argument for the party. So it makes sense for the uh, regime to democratize sooner rather than later in order to ensure the survival, if not continued dominance of the regime. But you're absolutely right, and I conceded to myself that regimes don't make decisions. Individuals make decisions and individuals have to make that choice. And so there is a disconnect between what is in the best interest and what kinds of risks the institution or the party is willing to take versus what the individual is willing to take. And Steve and I, in an earlier conversation, you know, I was recounting to him that when I shared this argument with folks in China and with party folks in China, they will say like, totally agree with the logic of your argument. Makes total sense for the CCP to consider this very seriously for all the reasons you've outlined. You know, the CCP is strong, it's, it's got uh, strong organizational coherence and, and, and so forth. But they'll say like, you know, um, but as an individual, I'd much prefer we uh, embark on these reforms after uh, my son graduates from Harvard. And I think that really reveals the disconnect between the institutional interests of the party versus the individual interests uh, or the self-interests of the individual. The risk to the party, while not insignificant, is one that the party as an organization is able to withstand. The risk to the individual, including, as you've indicated, the risk of retribution, the risk of uh, 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 post hoc um, uh, you know, criminalization, trials, and so forth, those are risks that individuals may be less likely to take on. Uh, and so if, if I were to you know, add to my list of reasons why I expect transition through strength to be improbable in China. It's precisely for the reason that you just said. It makes less sense for an individual to take that risk. Introducing uncertainty in which the costs on the individual are considerably higher than the party organization or institution make it less probable that individuals will make that choice. So you're absolutely right. One of the ways in which we've seen some of this play out in the case of Korea, for instance, um, and and the, the account that we provide in the book is that there's this extraordinary um, between Chen Duhuan and No Te Wu in their conversations in the summer of 87, when the outgoing dictator Chen Duhuan basically says to, and he was a real bastard, right? I mean, he was a real, um, he was a real dictator, says to No Te Wu, it's like, you know, you may want to concede democracy now. Uh, because the opposition is likely to split the vote. And so the ruling DJP party can more than likely maintain its plurality of votes in the, in the National Assembly. But you may also want to concede democracy now because then you can pardon. Uh, you can pardon those around you uh, and maintain the support that you need. So they actually go through this whole dramatic charade, this whole dramatic um, performance of uh, of contrition and concession, uh, when in fact it was really reflective of a bunch of side payments that had already been made to the outgoing dictator, um, that uh, that um, um, concessions and pardons would be made on his behalf. Now, we see later on, of course, uh, that playing out very differently as Chun and others are um, tried and found guilty of corruption and so forth. But in the initial deal that was made in 87, that was really one of the conditions for Chun to want to go along with that plan. So you've highlighted, anyway, all of this to say is that you've highlighted, I think, one of the main reasons why democracy in China remains improbable, even if the logic makes a lot of sense. The next question I pick comes from a Chinese student who is at a London institution, which is not so us. If I understand you correctly, the main incentive for the CCP to democratize is to gain more legitimacy and support. But does democracy lead to more support? It would depend on the patterns of the citizens, citizenry. And if the majority only cares about economic development, then the CCP should focus on economic development or at least a sense of economic development rather than focus on democracy? Um, 
the focus on economic development also generates the performance legitimacy for a ruling party to gain the electoral support it would need to win. So economic development and continued economic development is, um, is absolutely critical to the electoral fortunes of any regime. So um, I wouldn't suggest, or I wouldn't want someone to leave with the interpretation that by transitioning to democracy, you're jettisoning um, the economic development program of the incumbent regime. Uh, what I am suggesting, however, is that um, the introduction of democracy and conceding democracy, particularly when the incumbent regime is in many ways made, is, is allowed to or permitted to maintain its hold on power, allows that regime more latitude to bring into play new kinds of interest-based cleavages and so forth that it can actually trade on and dominate so that it gives it some um, so that does not rely solely on GDP growth uh, as its only, uh, maybe even if its main source of, um, of performance legitimacy. So take, for instance, in all three of our successful democracy strength um, scenarios, post-war Japan, KMT in the 90s, and the DJP in Korea in the late 80s into the 90s. In all three cases, um, the incumbent regime uh, not only continues to maintain a course of economic development, but by virtue of having conceded democracy is afforded the issue-based or cleavage-based leverage or uh, latitude to create new cleavages that work to their advantage. In all three cases, the conservative ruling or conservative incumbent regime begins to take on um, redistributive or at least distributive sensitive public policies and economic policies, which actually generate for the regimes even more power and more strength. So if one looks, for instance, at the LDP, not only does it resurrect in the 1950s and 1960s this industrial development and industrial policy machinery, it's also introducing macroeconomic policies around income doubling. It's also the time in which the LDP and not the JSP is introducing universal social insurance and so forth, which only strengthens the ruling party through democratic elections. The same thing happens in, in uh, Taiwan and Korea. It's the conservative incumbent ruling regime that introduces the first raft of, for instance, social, extensive social policy reform, which allows these parties to gain electoral support uh, through, um, through the introduction of democracy and by virtue of them being in a dominant position in which they're able to control um, the terms of democratic transition. So the, that's the long answer. The short answer is that the advantage of uh, conceding democracy, uh, particularly from a position of strength, is that it allows the ruling regime to generate new sources of political legitimacy and sources of political legitimacy that it can trade on if and when economic development alone or economic growth alone begins to slow. And that would be, you know, that should be something of concern to the CCP. Uh, because there are, um, there are some deep structural economic challenges that the regime will face over the medium to longer term. And it would be the best thing for the regime to be generating additional supplementary alternative sources of political legitimacy to keep the power, uh, regime in power, other than relying solely on economic growth. Swinging from students to a seasoned China watcher, the next question comes from John Eatings. Might it not be argued that in 1989, the party did have a choice? Many of the arguments in the 80s for democracy came from within around Hu Yaobang and his associates and were designed to democratize the party while retaining sufficient power to survive. There was a real possibility even in May to June when the moderate approach could prevail. In other words, the CPCP might have gone some way down the road, as indeed your analysis implies that the CPSU should have done. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think, you know, there was. Um... There was certainly a window of opportunity for the regime to have considered 
a democratic transition um, in the 1980s. And I think that uh, in 86 and 87 uh, was probably a more, um, a more accommodating scenario than by the time we get to 89. Um, because I think in 89, you, you have now a hardliner uh, faction that was uh, unapologetically willing to sacrifice Hu Yaobao in 87, uh, 86, 87. You have a disastrous, so in terms of proximate um, anxieties and proximate uh, causes for protest, you have a disastrous um, economic year in 1988. Uh, and so basically the mobilization of spring 89 I think in many ways is 86, 87 redo. So you do, I think, have an opportunity in 86, 87. It's not clear, however, uh, for a couple of reasons that the regime really was in the, um, it could have democratized and it could have democratized through relative strength, but there was still some, I think, structural weaknesses um, that the regime had to confront. Uh, one was there was, um, uh, a lack of consensus within the ruling regime around political reform. Uh, there wasn't really, frankly, a reform blueprint uh, that was available. So there were lots of discussions around administrative reform, lots of conversations around party reform. Um, but unlike, for instance, in uh, the case of Taiwan or even Korea, where you have electoral systems in place, where you have political parties that had already um, I mean, in Korea, you had opposition political parties. In Taiwan, you had the Deng Wai movement. Um, it wasn't clear that you had an opposition in place in the institutions to accommodate that opposition that would allow for a smooth transition to democracy. And lastly, I think, you know, this was in 86, 87, we're really talking less than a decade uh, or a decade from uh, the death of Mao, the end of the Cultural Revolution, the arrest of the Gang of Four, um, the economy was only really uh, picking up speed through accelerated reforms. After 84, um, the party itself was still, I think, in many ways, institutionally reorganizing, putting into place institutional mechanisms for the exercise of political power. It was really only beginning to discuss what a leadership succession mechanism might look like. It was still very much growing out of the personalist politics and informal politics uh, that had structured K uh, CCP politics up until the late 1970s. So yes, I don't think it would have been impossible, but I think in many ways the party was uh, weak enough that it lacked the confidence that it could preside over a stable uh, democratic transition. I would make the argument that the party today, or certainly three years ago, four years ago was in a much better position to seriously contemplate a concession through um, strength uh, scenario. Okay. Next question I pick is from a Chinese student at the University of Toronto. And the student would like to ask you about your thoughts on the, in quotation marks, twisted thinking, end of quote. To what thinking, sorry? Twisted, twisted thinking, oh. it distorted thinking towards democracy and freedom of the Communist Party. The student mentioned that when he or she was at the University of Toronto, there were so many mainland Chinese elite students thinking that all the media in the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada are manipulated by the American regime. And what happened in June 4th, Beijing 1989 was fake news. And no student was killed or died in Beijing that day. They have been studying in Western countries for a long time, and yet they do not have a good understanding of the Western systems. And many of those students still loved uh, President Xi and believe that what, whatever President Xi says is the truth. And what we believe 
are brainwashed by Western propaganda. Now, if that is how people think, why do you think your theory will apply? Well, yeah, that's um, that's an interesting observation. I mean, I think one of the one of the compelling reasons, or one of the reasons why our theory um, should at least get a listen to in the Chinese context is that it is not predicated on the delegitimation or collapse of the regime. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. It is predicated on the presumed strengths of the regime, and if anything, it's it's uh, the confusion rests in why such uh, such a regime lacks the confidence. Particularly now, I think in '89, as I as I pour over the archival evidence and the analysis at the time, in '89 I can see why the regime may lack may have lacked the confidence. The confusion today for people like myself who think what the Chinese Communist Party has done is nothing short of uh, remarkable and re miraculous. The confusion is, is why the party lacks such confidence today. Uh, and that's, you know, and, th and therefore, you know, it, it, the, the working proposition is not one that um, presumes imminent collapse, but rather the opposite. Uh, and so it's a strategic conversation as opposed to a critical con or a, cr a, cr a conversation rooted in criticism. Now, of course, as I said, I began, I have a normative commitment to democracy. And if someone wants to say, well, this is just your clever way of pulling the wool over the eyes of people and, and propagating what it is that you think is normatively right, well, that's their, their right to come to that conclusion. I think it's not inconsistent for someone who's writing a book like this to say, we have a normative commitment to democracy. But interestingly, democracy can arrive in contexts in which uh, we don't, it can arrive not in the wake of destruction and collapse, but actually in the wake of some real strategic leadership and strategic and self-interested strategic thinking on the part of the regime. As it, re as it relates to, you know, things like fake news um, and Western influence and so forth, I mean, it, it's, uh, what can I say, except, you know, I think in many ways that's further indication of a regime uh, that is uh, what I call, you know, what I call China's democracy avoidance. It is the active frustration of any democratic possibility. Uh, and, you know, that's a tactic, that's a strategy, that is a way of maintaining political power. Um, I always just say to my friends uh, in China who, or who think about China, that is what I always say is that um, nothing lasts forever. And uh, uh, best, to, best to get out or best to uh, transition when times are good and you can stay in power and you can uh, ensure um, uh, your continued uh, relevance, uh, if not dominance, better that than the alternative which is to be thrown out and become obsolete. And I think that would be disastrous for not only the party, but also for all of China. Okay. In the next lot, I will uh, put to you two complimentary questions from two veteran China watchers. Uh, Jonathan Fanby asks you, how likely is an authoritarian regime to enable the growth of independent institutions needed for democracy. And Norman Stockman would like to ask you that does not the language of conceding democracy assume that there is a strong demand for democracy? If there is not, with an authoritarian party which introduced democratic procedures be imposing democracy, the word concede seems to carry a lot of baggage. That's um, that's an interesting um, that's an interesting insight. Uh, both um, one of the things that we learn from the successful cases of democracy through strength is that not only are there um, not only is there the accumulation of antecedent strengths, there's also the institutionalization or the anti the the uh, 
preceding institutionalization of mechanisms that make transitions uh, more likely, even if uh, prior to transition, they were still short of democratic in practice. So take, for instance, I think one of the big challenges in Taiwan or in China is the absence of, um, of uh, elections or meaningfully, uh, meaningful yet limited elections. I think one of the greatest advantages that the DJP and the KMT experience, and even in the immediate post-war period in Japan, given their experience under Taisho or imperial democracy, was the earlier institutionalization of unfree, unfair, and limited, but nonetheless institutionalized elections. Uh, because this accelerated uh, not only the conversion of the ruling party to uh, an electorally contesting democratic party, it also accelerated the development of the opposition uh, and rules of the game in which the opposition can um, legitimately and fruitfully compete. So I think that you can have authoritarian regimes that put into place the institutional precursors of what become fully blown democratic institutions, but which in practice may remain limited, fractured, um, and um, uh, constrained in the pre-democratic era, um, elections and electoral systems being a perfect example of this. I mean, it, it's, it's no secret that um, the electoral system designers in the DJP, the KMT, and uh, the two conservative parties in Japan in 47, 48, had a very sophisticated understanding of electoral systems and the advantages it would uh, accrue to the incumbent party and the specific characteristics of the incumbent party, particularly large rural seat bonus. This comes through some limited institutional introductions or the introduction of limited institutions prior to democratic transition, which in the end made the transition smoother, particularly from the point of view of the incumbent regime. The question around concession, I think, is very interesting. I had not thought of um, the, the loaded uh, baggage that comes with it. Um, or I hadn't thought about it, I think that as deeply as, as, um, as our colleague has, has put forth. Um, we do stress, however, that in our theory, that um, authoritarian regimes will not uh, concede democracy when they are continuing to accumulate strength and when they continue to accumulate power. It's when they've passed the apex of power when their hold and grip on power is beginning to wane, necessitating a new re a new legitimation strategy for it to hold on to power, but oftentimes also marking the rise of democratic demands or the rise of demands for political reform, even if it's not um, uh, formulated in you know, democratic constitutional ways. So uh, electoral signals, the rise of contentious politics, uh, protest uprisings and so forth are all signals for a nascent demand for democracy. It may not be fully blown uh, and indeed, um, you know, a democratic revolution uh, occurs when a regime has already hurtled through the bitter sweet spot when it is already too weak. So it's incumbent upon from a strategic point of view for the ruling regime to interpret signals around the time that it's at its apex of power to interpret those signals to suggest a nascent demand for democracy, maybe a growing demand for democracy. So the vector is heading in that direction. And from the ruling regime's point of view to strategically preempt its delegitimation by introducing political reform. The next two questions that I will combine uh, in, in parallels to you are slightly hypothetical. Um, the first one comes from Sam Jackson, who is a master's student at King's College London, KCL. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what would democracy in China look like? If China did democratize, surely the Communist Party would remain a de facto authoritarian party without major competition. And the second parallel complementary question is from Milia How, the PhD student at SOAS, and she would like you to outline what you thought 
an opposition party in China in that context would be like, since any and every opposition that is emerging at the moment is being squashed by the party right away. Right. Um, so again, I think it's important that you know, a democratic concession is uh, one decision in a series of decisions that flips uh, a regime from or a political system from being one that is decisively and unequivocally authoritarian in terms of the prospects of an opposition party or an opposition, no matter how remote those prospects may be, has an opportunity to take power. So the movement from no opportunity at all to political uncertainty is the moment in which we are making a transition to democracy. After all, as Adam Jaworski always reminds us, democracy is about institutionalized uncertainty. Um, and they, you can have very uncertain situations or you can have very certain situations, but in which there is just the element uh, of uncertainty that is either there at the time or may emerge over time. There was no question that KMT was going to win founding elections in Taiwan, um, even with the opposition DPP. It just was, there was just no question. It was just impossible. DPP couldn't even field enough candidates in the electoral system that the KMT chose to effectively contest uh, all of the Li Fa Yuan seats. So that was just, you know, that was about as close to a certainty as you'd get. You go back to Korea in, 80, in the summer of 87, the big bet there was that Kim Dae-jung and Kim Yong-sam would split the opposition vote. And in fact, they would split it along regional lines. Now, was that a certainty that they would split the vote? No, but it was a pretty good bet. So there was an introduction of uncertainty. Uh, there was an introduction of uncertainty in the system, even though in the end, the ruling regime's bet paid off and, um, uh, and their, their uh, prediction uh, rang true. So I think, you know, but in both places, right, the field of play was relatively established. The KMT knew who the opposition was. There were electoral rules. There was an electoral system. These things all emerged prior to democratic transition. In the case of Korea, opposition parties, Kim Dae-jung and Kim Yong-sam had been contesting elections. Now they had been jailed at numerous times. They'd been silenced many times. Their parties had been split and splintered many times. But these institutional and practical precursors existed uh, prior to the moment of democratic transition. So, you know, those are important. So when people ask, well, what would democratic transition in China look like? I think that in many ways it would be chaotic uh, because there aren't those institutional precursors there right now. There isn't an opposition there. And as the questioner has rightly pointed out, anytime an emergent opposition uh, uh, rears its head as it is immediately quashed and thoroughly quashed. Um, so if the regime is thinking that a democracy through strength scenario is even in the cards as a strategic hedge, it should start introducing short of, even well short of democracy, some institutional innovations and mechanisms that will allow and facilitate a smoother transition to democracy if and when that ever emerges. It doesn't, it's not a concession to democracy. It's not leveling the playing field. It's not introducing the possibility that an opposition can emerge, but it's putting into place some of the institutions that might facilitate the transition. So there are, you know, again, one of the reasons why we would not expect a democratic transition to occur in China is because, as I said, one, the signals are terribly unclear. Uh, and two, it doesn't have the institutional antecedents to actually facilitate that kind of transition. It would be a disaster in, in, in short. Well, thank you, Joe. I am afraid that we are, I am being defeated by the clock that we have reached the magical moment of 6.31. So I will draw this webinar to a close with apologies to, um, many of you, about two thirds of you who have raised questions that I have not been able to fit into uh, the discussion with Professor Joe Wong. I am sure you would agree with me is that Joe has provided extremely thoughtful observations for us to think about.
and above all, something for Xi Jinping to think about if he wants to have a good future for people in China. I also, having said that, note that there is at least one of you raising a question which essentially says that we are doing very well in China. Why should we actually even think about uh, moving in that direction? And um, individuals must have the right to think what they think. But with this, let me draw this to a close. And thank you very much once again for Professor Joseph Wong of the University of Toronto. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Steve. It's great to see you.